My name is Lee J. Chase III. Today is April the 19th, 2005. We are in Memphis, Tennessee for the purpose of interviewing Frank Joseph Glankler, Jr. The purpose for choosing Mr. Glankler is part of the Legal History Project of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. For the record, would you please state your full name? Frank J. Glankler, Jr. It's part of my voice, but I've had a little problem with my throat. Mr. Glankler, what is the date of your birth and where were you born? December the 18th, 1925, in Memphis, Shelby County, Tennessee. Did you attend high school in Memphis? At CBHS, that was Christian Brothers High School, located in Old Parkway. And what was the year of your graduation from CBHS? I graduated in the summer of 1953. I mean, 1943, excuse me. All right, sir. And at the age of 17 years old, which would have been 1943, what was your next life activity after graduation from high school? Killing people. Uh, I joined the United States Marine Corps when I was 17. What was the reason that you chose to be a Marine at that time? I had a beloved mother and sister and father, and uh, I'd rather try to defend them over there than over here. What was your unit in the Marines, Mr. Glankler? I was in, attached to the C Company, 1st Battalion, 1st Regiment, 1st Marine Division. And where did your enrollment and participation with the Marines take you in terms of a theater of war in the <clears throat> early 40s? I was in uh, the Pacific Theater, uh, carrying an assortment of different weapons, but we landed on Peleliu Island, that's P-E-L-E-I-U-I, Peleliu Island on September the 15th, 1944. Was that one of the major battles of the South Pacific? Yes, sir. It was described as a tragic triumph because there were 17,000 Japs on it, and they'd had it since 1937, and they could drop a mortar shell in a wastebasket, uh, and they had coral caves, tunnels, and uh, automatic uh, uh, doors that would open, and the long toms would fire down the hills at you, and uh, so uh, it was, but they, unfortunately, when the Navy intelligence flew over it, they thought it would be a landing strip for the B-27s to go to Tokyo, you know what I mean, and to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But unfortunately, the airstrip was too small and too short, and therefore only fighter planes could land on it. Was that one of the major uh, war sites in the South Pacific, analogous to what we all know also was Iwo Jima? Yes, we uh, unfortunately lost uh, about half of the uh, whole division, some 15 to 17,000 men either killed or wounded. I got a little nick in my left leg on September the 19th, 1944, and I was evacuated to a hospital ship and subsequently brought back to the States. What did you do when you were discharged from the military, from your career as a Marine? I uh, went to Nashville, Tennessee in the fall of 1946 uh, and attended Vanderbilt University where my sister had gone. And uh, the reason I went there was being a veteran. If you took three years of college, you could uh, go to law school, and I, of necessity, had to go to night school because I had to have a job. Uh, while at Vanderbilt, did you have uh, uh, any activities in Nashville which you would describe in which you excelled during your academic career? Well, uh, pool shooting and beer drinking, primarily, but I did take courses in Latin and Greek etymology, and I took third-year Spanish. Uh, when you uh, finished your three years at Vanderbilt and 
considered law school. Yes, sir. Uh, where did you attend law school? I attended law school over the bus station at 3rd and Union Avenue uh, three nights a week. And uh, they later moved the little school out on, uh, it's called Southern Law University. They later moved that out on uh, Adams Avenue. Who was uh, the uh, teacher or professor or faculty at the Southern Law School? It, we were very fortunate in that Mr. Sam Margolin owned the school, and he, of course, was the dean. And then we had Mr. Sam Meyer, uh, Judge Irving Strauss, Judge Greenfield Pope, uh, Mr. Joe Beerman, Sr., uh, all practicing lawyers and judges, also to his honor, Judge Irving Strauss. And uh, so they were all practicing judges and lawyers, and they, were, they taught us Tennessee law instead of just general law. Let me ask you a little bit about your family background in, in terms of uh, the family's participation in the law. Uh, tell me, what was your father's profession? My father served briefly in World War I, but he read the, uh, memorized the eye test, and so when he took off in the airplane, he flipped it upside down. But anyway, he, uh, uh, was a public defender here in this county and then later a prosecutor and then he joined the firms which was then named Holmes and Canale and shortly thereafter he uh, the firm's name was changed to Canale Glankler Little Boone and Lark. When did your father join this law firm Mr. Glankler? Uh, I think 1923. All right, sir. And did he continue to then to practice law right on for up. his whole life after that? Yes, sir, in that firm. And then, of course, he was a senior member of the firm uh, within a few years of that date that I gave you. And uh, he unfortunately had a massive stroke over in the federal court. And uh, uh, in the trial of a case, of course, and uh, was homebound for another eight or nine months, and he died January the 4th, 1954. When did you get your law license? 1953. So you had an opportunity to practice with your father for a brief period of time? Yes, sir, but I mostly watched him. <laughs> All right. He has a, a reputation of having been an excellent teacher. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. One of the people that was early associated with you in your career was a man named John M. Heiskell. Tell yes. us about Mr. Heiskell and your career and participation with him. Mr. Heiskell was the then uh, district attorney here for Shelby County, Tennessee. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, uh, very shortly after my father died, Mr. Heiskell joined the law firm, and uh, I assisted him. He was my mentor in criminal matters, and I shared with him what little I knew about civil matters, and so we sort of bonded uh, in, in the practice. And that this is the first, I think, of our then law firm and later law firm uh, where we commenced to try uh, a number of criminal cases. Uh, in your career with Mr. High School, uh, are there any stories about you and he, how you interacted on various and sundry cases you might have been involved with? Well, we drank a little, uh, <laughs> but uh, he had one particular big case against Shelby County, and uh, being a a little bit of a civil lawyer. I shepherdized, back in those days, you had to use shepherd citator, the case that we were relying on, only to find out that that case had been overruled. And I brought that to the attention of Mr. High School, 
and he wanted to know what the hell that O was. And I said, well, that means it was overruled. He said, well, just forget about it. I'll see if I can't settle it before the other side knows about it, and we did. But thereafter, <laughs> we uh, kind of shared what little knowledge I had with his abundant knowledge. Over your career, you've been both a civil lawyer and uh, engaged as a criminal defense lawyer, have you not? Yes, sir. Uh, what is the difference between those two in terms of how you feel about the role of the different lawyer? Well, of course, the burden of proof is different because in the civil case, you just have to have the greater weight of the preponderance of the evidence. Uh, more likely than not is the verbiage. And in criminal cases, of course, the guilt of the defendant uh, must be established beyond a reasonable doubt. And our urging awful times, oftentimes to the jury would be, it is not up to a reasonable doubt. It's not a reasonable doubt. It is beyond a reasonable doubt. And we used to, of course, argue that your head must rest easily on the pillow tonight that you've done the right thing. During the course of your career here in Memphis, you've had the opportunity to uh, engage in advocacy with some of the premier lawyers that have practiced in the state of Tennessee, one of them being Lucius Birch yeah, that was... uh, here in Memphis. Yes, um, sir. On a civil side, is there any case you might want to share with us where you and Mr. Birch were involved? Well, we were involved on a number, but one that comes immediate to, immediately to mind would be a case involving a, I would call it a domestic imbalance a divorce. And uh, Mr. Birch represented one party, and I was fortunate enough to represent the other. And uh, Mr. Birch called me and told me to go out to that couple's home uh, one rainy night. He wasn't going to go. And uh, you have permission to talk to both of them, of course. And uh, so I repaired out there, and in the course of the evening, while millions of dollars were involved, the uh, parties uh, became at loggerheads over some Czechoslovakian crystal wine glasses, and there were seven of them for some reason. And uh, I kept asking them, why we couldn't resolve that one little minor issue, and neither one of them would respond. So uh, right or wrong, I just picked up one of the little wine glasses and broke it across the table. And I said, now we're even now, uh, sir and madam. Uh, is there anything else I need to adjust for you all? And uh, uh, they resolved the differences. What was Mr. Birch's response to you, if any? <laughs> well, he... <laughs> He just called me the next morning, and as soon as he told me it was Mr. Birch, I just said, uh, hey, Chief, uh, how's it going? He said, uh, you did a good job, Tiger, and hung up. <laughs> that was all he said. No other comment from him other than that? No, sir. I assume the divorce became final. Oh, it did. After your division of property. Well, <laughs> our division, but it did, it did resolve. All right, sir. Uh, let me ask also in regard to uh, uh, the other side of the, a criminal case. Um, you've tried few or many of those cases? Probably 75, but 30, uh, around 30 or 32 uh, murder one cases. All right. I want to talk about a, uh, a commercial criminal case first and ask you about a case uh, that involved an antitrust claim brought by the United States of America uh, in Houston, Texas, uh, yeah. involving a major industry here in the United States. Were you one of the lawyers in that case? Our firm was very fortunate to be uh, included in that case, yes, sir. Uh, approximately how many lawyers for the respective defendants in total were involved in the case? Probably a hundred. 64, I think, set first chair. As I recall, they had to move the uh, division wall from courtroom A to courtroom B to get all the people in there counting the, you know, the assistants and the paralegals and all those kind of people. Where did that case occur? 
uh, in Houston, Texas. How long did it last? Uh, approximately four months. Uh, given the scope of what was involved, I guess the first question is, uh, what was the outcome of the case? Well, uh, very fortunately, uh, and I say this for the members of the bar, of course, uh, we had met the night before the closing arguments would be, and uh, I said, I'm damn if I'm gonna stand up here and be the elected uh, point guard and argue for some seven individuals and five corporations that stand and do 40 years on the iron uh, unless I have y'all's specific permission because they sort of halfway had known it or appointed whatever it is, me, uh, to give the closing argument. I think it was because of my southern dialect. And uh, so having cleared all that, uh, that's the way we proceeded. And uh, the jury uh, found all the corporate and the individual defendants not guilty. Do you uh, recall whether or not the jury made any additional finding? Well, that's a little on a voluntary basis. That's a little embarrassing, Mr. Chase, but uh, I guess they were being kind. But they uh, came back with a. They said they just had a second verdict. I don't know what that was. So they they said that this speaker, Blankler, uh, was the lawyer of the case. For whatever reason. Did that make you puzzle over the jury's wisdom? Yeah, it, 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 it concerned me that what kind of a jury did I have? <laughs> if, 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 you know, if let, let me that. ask you also to, uh, to change to uh, the criminal side on a more personal basis. Uh, take, for example, a murder case. You've told us you've done a number of those cases. Yes, for some 30. Uh, let me ask you to talk about a pro bono murder case in which you were involved here in Memphis and ask you, why did you do that? I thought it was the right thing to do, Mr. Chase. What are the circumstances of the case? The defendant was an African-American gentleman and uh, he was huge. Tall, 6'5", probably close to 300 pounds, muscular. And uh, his employer called and said, I can't pay for your services. And of course, the defendant can't because he's locked up in jail. How Which long he, had he been in jail when you were contacted? He'd been there 18 months waiting trial. So I went down and met him and talked to him a bit. And I was convinced that uh, he did not uh, shoot the deceased uh, intentionally, that there was a struggle over a weapon. And we tried that lawsuit, and very fortunately, the jury found him, of course, not guilty. Were you ever paid for any of that service, Mr. Clank? No, sir. We, uh, I think I got the firm permission, if I didn't, I should have, uh, to expend uh, certain funds for expert witnesses. So, of course, you know, the awesome power of the government, the state can find their expert witnesses by picking up the telephone. So we did have a ballistics expert and a few little in-court examinations, uh, uh, reenactments, so to speak, and that carried the day. You have frequently been quoted as follows. The lives and liberties of the affluent are no more precious than those of the poor and the indigent. That's my credo, Mr. Chase. Uh, when I look at a person, uh, black, white, Hispanic, or whatever else, and whether they've got multi-millions of dollars so they can really fight the awesome power of the government, uh, I always feel a little churning in the stomach and in the heart that uh, an affluent client gets an affluent defense. You can outman them, you can outmoney them, and all that, but the poor and indigent are just there. And although we have excellent uh, public defenders, they just don't have the money bank to go to to get uh, 
find experts and things like that. And no disparagement to the public defenders, they just can't do it. So I feel that pro bono is a thing, to, is the way to go, and that people should uh, use the same fervor uh, in a pro bono case as they would in a, in a paid case, and therefore, that's why I always said that a fluent client gets an affluent defense, but what a pity, because the lives and the liberty of the, of the poor and indigent are just as precious as those of the affluent and the rich. Let me ask you this question, Mr. Glankler. When yes. we talk about death penalty cases, uh, have you been certified and through the schools uh, in order for you to represent and defend uh, people who may be exposed to the death penalty? Yes, sir. They came out with a new rule a few years back. And so I flew out to uh, California, I think it was, and uh, stayed there about 10 days and learned how to try a murder case. How many murder cases had you already tried at the time you went to this school? About 28. Did you at any time uh, have to teach the class as opposed to just attend the class? Well, they were very kind to me out there, and uh, after a couple of days, then I taught several of the classes on uh, criminal procedure, especially on Rule 16 and Reverse Rule 16 and the Brady material and things of that kind. Uh, and it was it was a very enlightening experience, and I I enjoyed it because I had my good friend, one of the local criminal judges here, said, you got to go to school to learn how to try a criminal case under the new rules of the Supreme Court, and if you fail, don't come back. So uh, I thought I'd better go out there and do it. I did that at my expense, by the way. What, what is your thought uh, on the issue of the death penalty as a punishment? I don't want to straddle the line because the only thing in the middle of the road is a yellow stripe or a dead skunk. But I am of the opinion that there are cases wherein the death penalty should be enforced. There are rapes, robberies, things of that kind where in, uh, death ensues uh, by a totally innocent person, such as these sexual predators and people like that. And I know that a lot of people disagree about that, but I think it has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis, because otherwise you, uh, your new technology with the DNA, as you know, have freed a bunch of people that have been uh, convicted and put on death row as a result of, quote, eyewitnesses who just frankly were mistaken. Let me ask you also, uh, uh, having talked about the affluent and their ability to create a defense, whether it be a civil or a criminal case, did you ever participate uh, in a case in Memphis where there was an affluent defendant in regard to a tax case? Yes, I was fortunate enough to uh, be engaged in, that, in, a, in, a, in such a lawsuit. Tell us about that case, if you will, in terms of uh, the size of the claim, uh, who were the claimants, obviously the United States of America, yeah. as the Internal Revenue Service, and the outcome of that case. Well, it started off as a criminal prosecution of the corporation. Now, of course, you can't put a corporation in jail, so. Uh, it should have been a civil case from the very beginning, but in any event, it was indicted, the company was, and they were charged in the indictment with approximately $253 million of taxes. Uh, the evening before, uh, two days before, the trial was to begin, uh, the government announced that they uh, had lost their primary witness, who we had a complete background check on. Uh, when I say lost him, he, he uh, was found drunk uh, in Memphis right before he went to the grand jury, and his wife had sued him for divorce uh, for using drugs and alcohol. And uh, I gave those two documents to the 
prosecutor, who was from Washington, one of three, I think, or four, and finally he said, well, where'd you get that? I said, it's a gun, it's a courthouse, you should have gotten one too. And we had a few other things on him. So the uh, government of the United States moved to dismiss their indictment without prejudice. And his honor, Judge McCray, said, oh no, if you're gonna dismiss it, you're gonna dismiss it with prejudice. And he did, and they did. And so then we went into the civil field with the IRS, and uh, some four or five years later, the government of the United States wrote the company a $4.7 million check as a refund. So that was a pretty good swing from 250 to uh, minus to plus four. And we were very fortunate in that case. Uh, let me ask you uh, to talk about, if you will, please, um, yourself in this context. Given the time that your father came to this firm and the time that you have been here, uh, have there been any other members of the Glankler family that have ever participated in this law firm? Well, my... Senior sister Winifred L. Glankler uh, was our uh, office manager, and uh, she didn't take orders from anybody, especially me. And uh, so she reminded me that we were supposed to go to lunch every Wednesday, but she was here several years, and we don't think we ever made it, but maybe once. And so she reminded me that the name Glankler was her name as distinguished from mine, and I, of course, accepted that. And the name of the firm at the time that she shared that with you was Glankler Brown PLLC, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. And did, did you believe her when she made that statement to you? Absolutely. <laughs> Let me ask you, too, uh, Mr. Glankler, a little bit more about yourself. In the context of any professional organizations within the practice of the profession, that you have participated. Could you tell us what those might be? Well, I've been very fortunate to be a, a fellow of the Tennessee Bar Foundation, and I've been a member of the Memphis and Shelby County Bar, the Tennessee Bar, the Federal Bar. I uh, was made a fellow in the American College of Trial Lawyers, which is, you know, is just one-tenth of one percent of the lawyers, I think, in the United States. In 1978, I uh, was listed in uh, NAFI's best lawyers in America on the two or three categories since its inception, I think, back in 1980, mid-80s, some 20 years. Uh, Strathmore's who's, who's who in America. Uh, on several other uh, senior counsel award a couple of years ago for Tennessee and the lawyer's lawyer award uh, several years ago here in Shelby County, Tennessee and maybe some others. I've heard a story, Mr. Glankler, that you appeared one time before the Tennessee Supreme Court uh, shortly after getting your license and yes. shortly after a fire that occurred at a courthouse. What is that story all about? Well, I I did appear before the Honorable Supreme Court, and uh, the clerk of the court came over and whispered to one of the justices, justices and he said, uh, Brother Glankley, you 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 not even listed as having uh, having a license in the state of Tennessee. And I said, well, Your Honor, I remember paying my $15 to Miss Bessie Buffalo. And Miss Buffalo was a clerk forever. But they did have a fire in the archives or wherever the building was. And most of all those records were, were destroyed and uh, or traumatized. So uh, they were kind enough to enter a order nunc pro tunc uh, back back to 1953 for me, and uh, so I proceeded from there. I had to pay another $15 to get enrolled, but they did enter that order. 
Do you remember what the outcome was on the case that you argued? Gosh. That's all right if you don't. I, I just don't know offhand. All right. uh, let me ask you, too, one of the men that you have practiced with for so many years uh, was a man named John Monte Donico. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Monte Donico is now deceased, but I'd like to go Correct. back in a point in time um, because he spans both your father's career and your career with this law firm. Yes, sir. Uh, do you recall when Mr. Monte Donico was hired at this law firm? He was hired in uh, 1937. And who hired him, do you recall? Well, he interviewed with my father and Tell they, us about that. they had a little colloquy. Uh, Mr. Glankler said, uh, we don't need a law clerk or a runner. Uh, what we need is a damn lawyer. And Mr. Mondonico responded, I'm a son of a bitch. And with that, my father said, well, we do need a senior partner. And I guess what he was envisioning was that in Futuro, Mr. Mondonico would become the senior partner following my father's death. And you too became a senior partner, but without the same epithet that Mr. Monte Donico had designed. Yeah, right. well, if Mr. Glanka Senior could speak, I'm sure he would have said that with a little <laughs> more eloquent language. All right. Uh, let me ask you, sir, in your own personal life here, <clears throat> you have a story that is widely known in this county. Uh, it takes place December the 23rd, 1990. Yeah, I remember that day and it involves an animal named Willie. Yes. What is, what is the story, Mr. Glankler? Well, very briefly, uh, Willie saved my life. He saved it on three or different occasions, but that particular day uh, was a bitter cold day, and I had gotten my Christmas presents for my family and all and put them out in the storeroom so they wouldn't see them, and I drove up to a little farm that we had at Moscow, Tennessee, and I headed back toward the swamps, and I just had on a jacket and a pair of old cut-off boots, and uh, ran into a hawthorn thicket. As you know, they're very dangerous, got big, long thorns on them. So I waved the dog around that, and we were just watching the ducks come in because they were wanting to put down their feet. And the temperature dropped to eight, eight degrees, and uh, it got pretty cold, but we, unfortunately, the beavers had dammed up a swale off the river, and I stepped in it and went through the ice, and it was about 12 feet deep. So when I came up, I was remembered to swim two directions, 25 and 25, and get on hard pan, but I was disoriented because I lost my glasses, and, and uh, I wound up in the edge of the Wolf River holding on to a tree. And uh, it got pretty dark right quick, and. So Willie stayed with me and kept barking and barking. And very fortunately, uh, one of my young partners, Mr. Bradley, was took his wife, young bride, up to show that little farm. And when he drove across the roads of the fields, he saw my truck. And uh, he left his wife in, the, in his little rig because it was stuck. And he went down to get, my, get me out of my truck, but he saw it was covered up with snow. so. He knew there was something wrong, so he walked a mile and a half up the road to the black gentleman that uh, farmed that soybean field mine and got him and his two sons, and they came down and uh, came into the edge of the swamp, but neither one of the three black gentlemen could swim, and they said, Mr. Frank, we know you're in there, and frankly, I had quit calling because I didn't want anybody else to drown. And, uh, <clears throat> the dog kept barking, and swimming in circles, and as I would put my head down to just take a little bit of a rest, he knew I'd been unconscious, and so he grabbed me and kept pulling on me, keep me from going to sleep. So finally the uh, rescue squad came, and I heard them yell, the old man's already dead, so we might as well get out of here. We got hypothermia. But one of my sons, Chris Glankler, uh, Mr. Bill Bradley, and Mr. William L. Hendricks, uh, came on in anyway, and Sam hollered out for me to swim over to him, and I said, well, if I could get hooked on this tree, I would, but right now I 
my hands are frozen to the tree. So anyway, eventually we, we, we got out and they took me to the hospital in Germantown. And Willie, your dog, got out also. Yeah, he, uh, he got out and then he abandoned me and he went home with Bill Bradley so he could sleep in a warm bed and he wouldn't let Bradley get in the bed and made him sleep on the floor, according to Mr. Bradley. And I just got a bottle of whiskey in a wheelchair and rolled across the road to my, to my home. And Willie lived a number of years after that. He and lived now 11 yeah. more years and he died in July of 1955. One of your pastimes now is to have another farm, is it not? Yeah, I still got one. And where is it located? Well, it's located in a, up on what we call Cemetery Ridge, and he's got a solid marble monument that says, "My best friend Willie." And where is that farm that you have now? Mr. It's in Martin? Hardeman County, out of Salisbury, Tennessee. Uh, and uh, Willie saved me again on a. Uh, water moccasin bite. Uh, I came in a little late one night and didn't turn the light on at the little boat dock and the dog was waiting for me and he leaped across the whole railing of the boat and grabbed this snake and went off in the water with it and I thought he was going to be killed or bitten and I could turn the light on then and saw blood and the dog pulled up out of there and the snake didn't have a head so I took him up and Gave him my steak dinner and my chocolate pie, and I drank whiskey. Let so, me ask you this: In Hardeman County, do you have any uh, immediate neighbors who are members of the judiciary of this state? I have one that's not too far, uh, probably 30 minutes from us, and that's the Honorable W. Frank Crawford, uh, who is a presiding judge and a judge on the Court of Appeals for the Western Section, and we see each other often. Mr. Glankler, you've been, you and the family of Glankler have been involved in the legal profession for 82 years, if my math is correct. That's correct. Always at this same firm. Yes, sir. Um, I want to ask you now two questions. Is there anything that you would just like to tell us about that I haven't asked, number one, and number two, how would you like to be remembered? Well, that's a pretty tough question, but I, I guess what I'd like to say is that uh, the ladder of success is only crowded at the bottom. So climb and climb, but with honor. And secondly, remember, of course, that pro bono cases, which are now required by our Supreme Court, should be uh, full motion the law firm's minds, all law firms, and that, uh, again, the life of the rich and fluent are no more precious than those of the poor and indigent, and we should represent them with the same vigor as we would the former. That's about the size of it. During the course of your professional career, um, and based on some of the things you have said, I have a sense that you've participated uh, in the practice of law or preparation of legal matters involving uh, foreign lawyers and foreign governments and so on. Tell us about that, if that is correct. Well, we had the uh, opportunity to uh prepare what is termed a reinsurance case. We're like Lloyds of London has a reinsurance on, or the insurance, excuse me, on ships going across the oceans and all carrying, you know, various and sundry goods. And then you would have reinsurers that would pick up a part of that percentage and part of that premium, uh, part of the percentage of liability and part of the uh, percentage of the premium. So. Uh, uh, we prepared that case in uh, uh, England and Spain and Geneva, uh, one or two other countries I can't recall right now. With the interaction for 
uh, you as an American lawyer being in one of those foreign countries, um, how did you feel the American legal system worked as opposed to the English system or some other system in Switzerland as an example? The American system uh, was much, is much more or was in depth because we have discovery and you didn't have any discovery in the UK and so they would bring what files they wanted to uh, depositions and refused to bring others. And I recall a specific memorandum that they met in uh, some of the people in the UK on July the 4th. And I said, but that's a national holiday. And this guy got a little red in the face. He said, well, we don't actually celebrate that day over here, Mr. Glanklin. And I said, oh, well, excuse me. And uh, so her honor, Judge Gibbons, uh, reminded all of them that uh, we were under the federal rules of civil procedure in uh, the state of Tennessee and made them bring all their uh, memoranda and so forth to the various depositions and that opened a lot of doors for us, it really did. And in Germany, you, uh, the judge uh, conducts examination and he just asks the witnesses what they say, uh, what, what, what do you know and he would take little notes, and then uh, all in German. And uh, fortunately, I had uh, uh, John Kruger, who was with Baker Donaldson now, uh, with me, and he was uh, very fluent in German. So uh, he'd say, that ain't what I heard. <laughs> and the judge would read off for the record uh, what the witness had testified to. So it was pretty archaic. Uh, you, you use the term discovery. Yes, uh, in the statement you just made, uh, when you started, what was the method of trial as it was colloquially <laughs> described in, in the early days? It was trial by ambush. And what does that mean? Well, that meant that you didn't have any discovery until the discovery rules came in in the, either the mid-50s or the late 50s. And uh, so you just went to court with what you had and the other side went to court with what they had and that's why you tried your lawsuit. You mentioned, too, having attended this school uh, in California on the death penalty and, and the criminal rules of civil procedure. What is your... Wait a minute. Criminal rules of... Criminal rules of criminal procedure. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, what is your opinion in regard to the wisdom or fairness or lack thereof of the early system versus the way the law is now practiced with so much discovery, both civilly and criminally? One can, <clears throat> excuse me, one can use enough effort uh, to uh, exacerbate or expand a relatively simple issue into a complex morass if they're so inclined mentally to do it, uh, unfortunately. Uh, still, the discovery, while it's broad, you know, should only be used uh, with decency so that you uh, just really discover what you need to know and not just, you know, across the board discovery for waste of time and money. Because of the complexities that we now have in the law, such as discovery, both from a civil side and a criminal side, how does, a, how does one lawyer, in your opinion, uh, cope with the issue about whether he or she could be both a civil lawyer and a criminal lawyer like you have accomplished in your career? Can you do both effectively in the 21st century, in your judgment? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. With the advent of technology, there are a number of lawyers right here in Shelby County, Tennessee, a handful of which I could even name, that do both. But they are schooled in the civil law and in the uh, criminal law by attending seminars and things of that kind, and they're very effective. Uh, as I said, along with that 
modern technology that you have today. Uh, but by and large, a, pra a practitioner probably, and I don't want to demean anybody's ability, but probably should uh, uh, pick one or the other. Because as you know, there's so many specialties now, family law, labor law, securities law, and all that. And, uh, but there are, there are a good little number of men that, uh, and ladies that uh, do try both criminal and civil cases, and they do it very effectively. What is your view, Mr. Glankler, in, in regard to the evolution of technology in the profession of the law? I'm, I'm sorry, but I missed the first part of the uh, question. What, what is your view uh, in terms of whether or not technology has advanced the profession of the law, the delivery of justice, uh, made the lawyer a better advocate, or has it just made us look more at minutia? I, I think it's advanced. Uh, advanced technology has uh, uh, enhanced the, enhanced the, the practice in both areas. Have you used the technologies that are available in your professional career? I use some. You have frequently described yourself to me as a book flipper. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, I like to get my law from the books and not from the court and not from other lawyers. Uh, when we had a library upstairs, and uh, I would like to go to the, uh, to the digest of Gibson Suits and Chantry, and of course the federal system, uh, especially on the Brady material and things of that kind, and uh, reciprocal Rule 16. But I like to read the cases and then find out what the guts of the case holds, not just the syllabi. You can go wrong when you read the syllabi, but if you go to the to the actual discussion and rendition of the judgment, you can find uh, many, many cases that will assist you. You grew up a, 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 in your professional career uh, under a system that appears to be based on a mentoring. You described your relationship with Mr. John High School as yes, sir. he was your mentor. Absolutely. Does that occur today, and should it? Well, it should. Uh, I'm not sure it occurs as we speak uh, to a very large extent, but uh, I think it definitely should because, you know, there's nothing like describing a train wreck unless you see one. And if you go with an older, older lawyer, a more experienced lawyer, even if you sit second or third chair, don't participate. See how he addresses a jury. How he handles the voir dire, how he handles the opening statement, how he handles that that fatalistic blow called cross examination, where you ask one question too many, and uh, that can come home to bite you. So I think that uh, that uh, partners uh, ought to really take uh, junior partners, go on and share the wealth. Uh, you know, if they get paid a fee, well give them part of it or whatever, or uh, associates, and uh, take them with you and uh, let them see. I know that my beloved father always told me that when you face a jury, you should be a midget. You should look up at them because they're going to decide your fate. And there also are 12 potential new clients exponentially. 12 times 12 is 144. Because they'll go home and whether you lost or won, they'll say that guy speaks plain language and we can understand him. And uh, by the way, if you've had a car wreck, you ought to call Joe Smith, whatever his name was. And that's been my experience. When you came to this law firm uh, in 1953, I believe it had approximately seven members. Yes, sir. How many? Uh, members and associates are there in this law firm at the present time, approximately? Uh, about 68. How do you mentor in a system where 68 lawyers practice together on an organized basis? I really don't know how it's done today, 
but I would hope that the more experienced, I won't call them older, uh, trial lawyers would reach down and get a younger member or a uh, young associate and take him or her uh, with them when they try a couple of cases. Because as I said, there's just nothing like seeing it. Uh, you know, uh, how you address the court, how you address the jury, uh, how you dress. Sometimes you might want to leave a, a button off your sh shirt and have the jury look at that and say, that guy's a regular guy, he got a button missing. A wrong uh, black shoe and a brown shoe sometimes and things of that kind, because he's going after the facts. He doesn't care what he looks like. And half your jury are composed, generally, of working people, and they can identify with that. Did you ever do anything like that in your uh, career? Quite often. And did it work? Pretty much. Let me ask you uh, about yourself a little bit. What sort of special interests do you have as hobbies or other uh, non-legal activities? Well, probably my sole hobby now is uh, rescuing stray dogs and uh, taking them in and keeping them. And they're growing by numbers. and. Uh, my other, of course, is being at the farm in Salisbury where we've got 500 acres and a lake and uh, all kinds of wild animals that, that I feed throughout the year to maintain them. And they go from deer to turkeys to bobcats to foxes and raccoons and possums and just every kind of animal there is. There's some 70 species up there, including birds. and. Uh, one of your young partners uh, or associates is Mr. Kevin Cox. And I form, <clears throat> excuse me, what is called EARL, E-A-R-L, Exotic Animal Rescue League out in Germantown. And they take in all these stray things and they'll call me about every week or 10 days usually and say, we've got a pair of bobcats here. We've got a, this, that. I take everything, but uh, if it, if it can't wear earrings, I won't take it like uh, snakes. But everything else we take and turn loose up there on the farm because they've got a habitat where they won't be disturbed. I don't allow any shooting up there except, you know, once, twice a year uh, to thin out some of the herds. But the rest of the time is uh, spent watching them and uh, watching them grow and watching them multiply. During your... I do shoot coyotes, excuse me. During your career, uh, would it be correct that you've had a number of friendships with other lawyers in particular here yes. in Shelby County, Tennessee, and part of that friendship has involved some of your hobbies like fishing and hunting and so on? Is yes, that true? Sir. Yes, sir. What, what do you think uh, that has added to your life? I think it's added a lot. Uh, you don't learn by talking, you learn by listening, and the Honorable Jerome Turner was an avid duck hunter, although sometimes he claimed the ducks that uh, somebody else would shoot, but he would, he would be a constant goer, pheasant hunting and duck hunting and the like. And uh, Mr. Jim Causey, uh, who's an excellent lawyer uh, and a very, very good friend, I hope, of mine. And uh, he likewise uh, hunts a lot and fishes a lot. Uh, there, there are a number of others that would go with us. Mr. K. Wood, David K. Wood, and they go to South Dakota, and we used to go to Mexico and shoot white-winged doves and give them to those poor people out there that don't have anything to eat. And uh, so we've enjoyed having that camaraderie. With all of these things that you've had, your professional career, uh, your family, uh, your interest with your friends and so on. How have you managed to balance all these interests in your life to keep your priorities the way you wish them to be? Well, I made this observation uh, earlier that uh, some intelligent man, I don't recall his name at the moment, said that the law is a jealous mistress. And I really kind of think it's a jealous wife. But in any event, uh, it's a very delicate balancing act 
to put all of your energies, all of your thought processes, all of everything that you've got, which as Kipling said, when there's nothing left within you except the will that says, hold on, uh, and do that for a few days or a few weeks and sometimes months in a uh, long trial. And at the same time, when you do have that break and you're with your family, you need to uh, exert all the energy that you can with your wife and or your children, you know, so that uh, you won't be a stranger in your own household. And it's a, it's a very delicate balance. But they have to understand. They just have to understand. In, in your career, uh, you've mentioned some of your individual pro bono activities where you've participated either civilly and or in a criminal uh, setting. Let me ask you this. Do you have an opinion and what is it uh, in regard to what is a lawyer's responsibility in regard to pro bono work? Should it be mandatory? Uh, yes. Uh, if it weren't mandatory, unfortunately, some of the practitioners just wouldn't do it at all. And uh, so the Supreme Court has passed, or Tennessee has passed a rule that requires uh, pro bono cases. And it's just an awful small amount of your time compared to your productive time money-wise. And uh, you receive a, a certain self-satisfaction that you've done something for somebody that couldn't do it by themselves or for themselves because they couldn't pay for it. And then you receive the satisfaction of the judiciary. Uh, you know, you get their respect. And of course, the public at large. Uh, in a medical matter, there ain't two sides. It's just the doctor and your patient, you know, and if the doctor said, well, your mother-in-law had long fingernails, therefore you need to come see me, they rush out there to see him. But in a legal matter, you've got a contested pair of people or more uh, with divergent views and they're at each other's throat. And so you have to, you have to try to uh, enhance the public image to the legal profession. It's not a business, it's a profession. And so the profession says, just like the Hippocratic Oath with doctors, you took an oath, and we all took an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States, and that has an awful lot in it. And we just should use our same efforts and energy on the indigent cases as we would on the ones that pay you. In how many courts in the United States uh, have you appeared? Uh, Twenty plus. 20 plus courts or 20 plus states? Oh, 20 plus states, yes, sir. From your perspective of having appeared as a lawyer in 20 states in the United States over your career, is the system of justice in the United States served well by the profession that you have observed as it has been practiced in those states? I think very, very uh, well balanced uh, with the possible exception of California. And why do you isolate on California as being different? Well, we were taking a, <clears throat> excuse me, a series of rather complicated depositions in a case pending out there in California. Uh, I remember one now in Idaho, too. But anyway, in California, and uh, the young lawyer on the other side, uh, we agreed to double team. In other words, the time was short, so we would take two depositions at the same time with a different lawyer from our different firms. And this young man had a little problem about scheduling, and I think it was some family matter. And so we agreed and drew up a consent order and uh, took it over to the clerk to enter it. And they called and said, uh, we want you in court in 30 minutes. Well, we went to court and uh, the judge said, who are you? And I told him and uh, he turned to the young lawyer and he said, uh, 
I could have you disbarred for this. And I stood up and I said, wait a minute, Your Honor. You can't disbar a lawyer for having an agreement with counsel. I'll do what I damn please. And I said, you may do it, but you'll get reversed because I'm going to represent him. And with that, the judge said, well, I'm going to take this order with me and I'll sign it when I get damn good and ready. Well, that following Monday was a cutoff and that was Martin Luther King's birthday, I happen to remember. And that judge went on a fishing trip or whatever and never came back until the following Wednesday or Thursday when our deadline had already passed. And then the fellow finally signed his name to the order. And the next time I went in there, he pointed at me and I said, Your Honor, I really don't like people to point at me. And uh, I'd appreciate it if you just verbalized your complaints against me. And, uh, you know, don't make a mistake, because if you do, I'll reverse you. But anyway, he, uh, he uh, was uh, very difficult to deal with. And he was a United States District Judge, too. He was very, very difficult. And uh, I didn't appreciate uh, the way he treated that young lawyer, because it scared the boy, the young man. And I don't blame him for being scared when he said I could have you disbarred. That's much of poppycock. Let me ask you uh, to comment on... the same on, problem in Idaho. Let me ask you, Mr. Glanker, to comment on the importance of civility amongst lawyers as they practice their profession in their office and before a court. Is that important? Mr. Chase, it is the epitome of importance. The Honorable Jerome Turner wrote a pamphlet about civility among lawyers and among the judiciary as well and of the witnesses. And uh, unfortunately, in this last decade that I was active, uh, you would file a lawsuit and when you open your mail the next day or two days later, you'd have a Rule 11 file against you for filing a lawsuit without proper investigation of facts. Well, I don't know how the hell another, excuse me, I don't know how another lawyer knows how much I investigate before I sued his client, unless he's reading my mail. So uh, I, I don't appreciate this, uh, I will call it this nuance or this new attitude that especially some of the younger lawyers in the bigger firms operate today. Uh, you and I were practicing all along. I could call somebody on the phone and say, my dog is sick and I want to put this deposition off. You say, book it and hang up. Right now, you write them a nice letter and tell them you've got to be in another court somewhere or whatever. They don't make a difference. They'll still write your letter back and tell you that they're going to file a Rule 11 or motion to dismiss or something like that. And that is abhorrent because that buzzard will come home to roost if you do it to us enough times because, uh, you know, we put a mark of cane on their forehead and make them toe the line from then on. And uh, that's just not the way to practice law. In, There's enough problems without being uncivil. In recent days, unfortunately, we have seen the judiciary uh, exposed to threats of bodily harm, if not their actual murder apparently by clients. Is it the client that is causing this or is it the legal system that is contributing to the apparent anger of people against the law or those that operate professionally within the law? I'm not, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not conversant on the recent happenings that we've all read about uh, but one, of course, uh, is the lack of security in courts. You don't have that problem in the Western District of Tennessee over here in the, in the uh, Clifford Davis building. You don't have that problem because you got those big U.S. Marshals over there and one of them is, is not, uh, uh, doesn't carry a weapon to bring the prisoners in the courtroom, but he's got two fists about the size of a football and then the other two sit across the room and they got 
weapons and they just sit there, you know, very quietly. But uh, there's, there's, we don't have any outbreaks like that. And I don't think we've had maybe one or two in the criminal court of Shelby County. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the uh, judiciary uh, in some states, and I'll mention Florida, of course, uh, that have taken past rapists, uh, past pedophiles, and everything else, and put them under a $100 bond or a $500 bond till their trial comes up, and they'll go out and commit another rape or another robbery or another murder. And uh, that's just, uh, if you ever watch O'Reilly on the factory at night, you'll see that he's really attacking the whole state of Florida about their judiciary because they're, with all due respect to them, they're, they're a number of them are just incompetent. And the way to get rid of them is to vote them out, of course, next time. You have always participated in your legal profession as a lawyer. Have you ever given any thought to a difference in career and considered being a judge? No, sir, I don't think I'm qualified to be a judge, but uh, I have set a special judge for the Honorable Kenneth Turner uh, on several occasions when he would go on, on vacation down in the, in the juvenile court, and I'd probably sit a day or two in the criminal court and maybe a couple of days over in the civil courts. What do you think should be a lawyer's expectation of a judge? Again, civility. Uh, require everybody to comport to the rules of court, to uh, uh, have everybody comply with the orders of the court, and uh, give the people a chance to be heard. Uh, that's one of my pet peeves about the oath that witness takes. I don't think you want to hear it. Well, yes, I do. What is it? Well, when a witness hits the witness stand, which is, of course, not a stand. That's coming from England. We're in a witness chair. You raise your right hand and put your hand on the Bible, or you say, I swear or affirm, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now the judge is cutting you, the witness, off if he doesn't just simply answer yes or no or directly to the question. He ought to be able or entitled to answer the question and then explain why his answer is what his or hers is, because that's the whole truth. And as you know, half truth is a whole lie, but if you, uh, <laughs> if you under oath, you ought to be able to explain your answer to get the, get the full import of what it is that you've got on your mind and what you said. Now, I don't mean something extraneous, you know, something like that, but, uh, you know, I talked to so-and-so because, and that's the reason they did it, and they ought to be able to say that.